You know, I like I like Elon Musk, although, you know, I, no, I, I don't trust many people at all, but, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, we are, if you remember, we are continuing the saga. There is a break, a chapter break. You know that all the all the um, all the verses were added. Uh, we're not exactly sure when, but probably around uh, I think I've told you before 600, 800 A.D. They began adding verses, and or no, they added started adding chapters, and then they eventually added verses. And part of the verses, we believe the versification happened as a result of. We're not sure exactly what caused versification. The chapters were pretty obvious. As you invent punctuation, one of the first things you do when you invent punctuation is you put spaces between words. Spaces between words make it readable. Then you begin to add like paragraphs. And you, you, you know, as you gain paragraphs, you want to, you want to divide sections into readable parts. So you go to chapters, for example. And then in versification, we believed, we believe that what happened with versification is the um, the Christians were really causing issues as teen hodos for the Jewish community. Because the Christians had their codexes and they could immediately pull out chapter and verse. Ha <laughs> ha, there wasn't a chapter and verse, right? They could quote from the Septuagint specifically and also from the Greek New Testament documents. Because remember I told you, they're mnemonics. So the people would memorize it. And those who couldn't even read had memorized the text. How do you learn to read in the ancient times? You memorize and use the, word, the mnemonics. That's the way it works. So we believe that what was happening is the Jewish scholars were really feeling a, pre a problem that those Christians were bringing out, the Christians were quoting. And so what they did is they wanted to be able to go to chapters and verse. They wanted to go to, they wanted to find the material better and quicker so they could confute the Christians. That got even more important with the Quran, right? When the Quran came out, <laughs> when the Quran came out, there was a serious problem for them because the Quran has some kind of it 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 aligns to a degree because when when Muhammad Muhammad couldn't write. When he told someone what reflection he got, by the way, he did it three times, and each time was different. But when he told what to write, many of the things he got, he'd gotten from both the Christian and the Jewish scriptures. We know that he went to Jerusalem and studied the Jewish, his intent, and he wrote this. His intent was to create a religion that would align the Arabic tribes. And he basically took their pagan source religion and mixed it with Christianity and Judaism. And so you get, guess what? You get historical information from Judaism and you get historical information from Christianity and you get them kind of melded into his, in the Quran. So it became very important, especially for the Jewish members, because what, what did the, what, what does the Quran say? that you should overcome the infidel, uh, that's you guys, Christians, Gentiles, Jewish people, and you tax them. They can retain their religion, but you tax them, which, by the way, they learned from the Romans. You know, I, I don't think someone asked, Tammy asked this question to me, said, why did the Romans get so irritated about proselytizing? And why was it such a big deal for Christianity in the early years? It's because... The proselytizing, the, the Romans believed, the Romans noted the problems of the Assyrians and the Babylonians in the past. What they had done is they tried to sub, subjur, subjuvert, subvert the religions of the people. When you do that, you create martyrs, you create a problem, because then the religion goes underground, and you have a real problem with 
rebellion. That's what happened, by the way, to both Damascus. I remember the uh, Babylonians learned their lesson, right? The Persians. What happened to Darius? Tinkle, tinkle, meaning whatever, that writing on the wall. He basically, what, recovered Ju the Judaic religion. You know why he did it, right? Why do you think he did it? If you're a king and you've lost control over a land, what's the best way to get control of the land? Well, you send your subjects to their land, right? All the subjects were pulled into Babylon. Babylon took all the subjects and castrated all the men, but they pulled all the, uh, you know, the royalty, the nobility, all the educated people from Jews, from, you know, the Jewish people into Babylon. Well, guess what? What had happened to the Levant? It's fallen out of their control after Persia took them over under Darius. So Darius was a smart guy. Darius wanted to regain control of the Levant. So what did he do? He sent Persian Jews to the Levant and said, hey, you can have back your religion. And what did they do? They came. They went back. And then what happened? The Persian problem. What happened to Persia? 232, is it 232 or 332? 232? I think it's 332. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great swept through the world. And what did he do? He took Levant, he took Turkey, he took Persia, he took Damascus, he took Egypt, he took all of, of Greece first. That's That was his problem. So Darius lost because who took over the Levant? It's now controlled by the Greeks. That's the Maccabees. That's the apocryphal documents that we never studied, that we ought to be studying, right? That we had a class in. We had a couple of classes, I think, of it in the apocryphal documents. And then what happened? I've been watching the Chosen. It cracks me up. Who asked the Romans to come? Yeah, they asked, to, they asked them to come and help them with the Greeks. And the Romans are like, oh, yeah, we'll help. <laughs> right? And they slowly took over. It's like, you know, look, don't blame them. Don't, if you ask the British to come in and help you, don't blame them because they're asking for more taxes. You got to do something about it, right? Anyway, so the big deal here is we, we don't seem to realize, we don't, you know, we're not taught this, but now you got it, right? The versification in the chapters became important because people wanted to look it up. As a matter of fact, what do we do today? You ever heard of Bible sword drills? Oh, I did those in the Seventh-day Adventist school that I've been to for a few years. I got really good at it, too. Yeah, me too. The first thing you do is they have you memorize all the books of the Bible in order. So you can find a book. And then you have to, you don't have to know how many chapters, but, you know, we have chapters and verse in the Bible. And so most evangelical churches and most churches, I don't know if Lutherans do that. I wasn't a Lutheran kid. But, you know, the Lutherans ought to. You have sword drills. They tell you, Jeremiah, you know, 2410. You know, and you look it up. And the first person to look it up stands up. And they read it. You know, and it's a big deal. If you're the winner, you're like, you know, they give you marks. You get, get, get something, you know. Back in the day, you used to get a little card. But nobody cares about that anymore, right? There's way too much of that stuff. Uh, the printing process, but the versification allows you to find stuff quickly. The problem with chapters of versification is what? It sometimes artificially gives us a sense of like interruption or a change to a narrative or something like that. Yeah, and many times uh, I haven't caught a lot because the problem with Greek is Greek. <laughs> It, we would probably say that Greek is run on sentences. Because Greek, if you notice all the chi's, chi means and. So they liked to put stuff together. And I visited John, and John came with me, and so did Mary. And Jesus said, 
and they went and they go on and on and on and on because they like their run-ons. Matter of fact, most of our kids like their run-ons. How many of you guys got had, got corrected for run-on sentences when you? Yeah, you see, everybody's nodding. If you didn't, you need to be a, a Hemingway writer, right? Hemingway probably never got caught for run-ons. Oh, Maverick, maybe he did, and that's why he just writes so tersely, you know, because he couldn't help himself afterwards. But you know, usually the Greeks really like to throw things together, and I haven't caught him. When I catch it, you know. I'll, I'll point it out, but the way they write tends to make stuff, um, it, it, it's easy to tell where one idea starts and one idea kind of ends-ish. Although we do catch some places where, you know, in a dialogue, they may not tell us. We may get confused about where it's going because of their expectation of the way that their, their vocabulary works. But anyway, the way their grammar works. But the big deal is, we, we have this break in chapter, what chapter, 10, 9 to 10. There's no break. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, his Pharisees, right? And he's going from the man who was born blind into, oh, it's still about the man who was born blind, except now he's talking about the sheep, and the sheep fit right in there. And so we've gotten to seven, and I want to remind you, it says, this is the translation, according to Jesus, said anew to them, Firmly, firmly, I make a logical argument to you that I am the gate of the sheep. And least you say that's euphemistic, it is not euphemistic at all. And this is what I want to point out to you. Don't forget, we're still talking about the man who was born blind. This is about the man who was born blind. So that, therefore, uh, do you remember, what is, what is Jesus talking about in this? It's, is the, are the sheep seeing them? The sheep are... Hearing, hearing, here's his voice, Akeo, here's his voice, here's the tone. That's what we're getting. There's, there's, there's going to be some seeing verbs, but most of the verbs are good also. Knowing, what we would translate as know properly, where the Greeks, most of their knowings are not knowings at all. They're seeing physically. They're seeing stare at, where in this case we get this statement. I am the gate of the sheep. And here it is. Here's the shepherd. He is the gate of the sheep. So this is a concrete, a literal concrete statement, fully understood by those from a rural background of Judea and the Galil, likely understood by the Greeks and possibly the Romans. I, I don't know if the Romans and the Greeks did this, but I prob they probably did. I don't know how they did their sheepfolds, but this is the way sheepfolds were done in the Levant. And, you know, I was thinking the whole time today when we were doing our prayers of the day, it, it used the term love. And I'm thinking the whole time, in what sense do you mean love? Don't you think that sometimes? Because it says, you know, we love each other, we love God, you know, God loves us. And, and you know, the Greeks will tell you. Right? And we're going to get into more of that, too, which is really cool stuff. Anyway, this is literal, and this is a literal understanding. Now, if, if you had your rabbi, right, remember what did they tell them? Now, this is late, you know, 90 AD or so, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Temple of Jerusalem, so the, the next diaspora. But remember, what did they tell them in Luke? They said... The people should go to the synagogues to worship Christ, Teen Hodos, because basically the Torah, the Word of God, is taught by the rabbis in the synagogues every Shabbat. So when this comes up in John, what do they ask their rabbi or their leader, whatever you want to call them, their in this time, presbyters, and there's other words that are being used, right? The elder, they would say, wait, wait, a gate? How can Jesus be a gate? An ego imi, I am, a direct statement of reality. And guess what they would do? Back when I lived in the Levant, back when I lived in Jerusalem, back when I lived in near Nazareth, right? This is what a sheepfold is like. 
even if the Greeks and the Romans didn't do it. I, I don't know. I didn't research that very well. So we go to this. It says, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. Listen to them. The man born blind. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Pantus saw all the whole as how much, how great they came or went off before of me, thieves who steal by in secret. They are, and thieves stealing in the open, typically violence, other things, contrary wise. They did not hear of them, the sheep, the things that walked forward. <laughs> it's re we can't forget that we have gone, we have not gone away from the section about the man born blind. The man born blind is still what we are talking about here. Jesus is specifically addressing his Pharisees. And remember what was the last thing his Pharisees said at the end of 9? When we have our artificial break, they said, are you saying that we are blind? And guess what Jesus is doing? Now he's talking all about hearing. I know. He's giving them hope. Do you see this? He, there's hope for us, even if we're Pharisees. I, I like the chosen. They got the black belt Pharisees, the blue belt Pharisees. You see that? The red belt Pharisees. Do you see that? that? The Nicodemus is a black belt Pharisee. He's wearing the black, right? <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was kind of funny, right? Because they're all, and I'm thinking, those guys got to be Sadducees. You know, Nick Davis is talking to the guys with the red, maroon. And are those Sadducees? What's going on here? Anyway, um, the whole, how many came off before me? I left it in the total to Greek. I could have said everyone, but it says specifically in the Greek, the whole, how many came off before me? There are thieves who steal by stealth in secret, and thieves stealing out in the open. Contrary-wise, the sheep did not hear them. All about hearing. The impression we have in this verse, in this verse, in this statement, I don't like to use the word verse, in this statement is permanence. You see this? It says, the whole that came off before me, right? Jesus is what? The gate. And if, if, okay, now, we know that the shepherd as the gate, I don't know how they did it. Maybe they had, maybe the young shepherd came while the old shepherd, but I expect the, the shepherd was the gate until when? Until the sheep went out of the fold, right? But the point is that whenever the sheep are in the fold, is a shepherd going home for lunch? No. No. He's, he's probably waiting for somebody to come relieve him. Maybe his wife's bringing him, like, supper in a pail. I mean, you know, that's what we do, right? Us and guys, we're, we, we, well, gals too, but, you know, you're bringing your, your lunch in a pail to work. That's what I did. But anyway, that's the thing. He's the gate, and it's permanent. What does a thief do? They come and go, right? They're not hanging around. They're not going to be the gate. They're not. Don't stand on the wall if you're stealing sheep. And, and what are you going to do anyway? Do you, do you lift the sheep over the wall? This is kind of a funny thing anyway. But um, there's an impression here. But we're going to find out more about it. The others came and stole and left. The thing is that they, they probably wouldn't be stealing the sheep. They might be. We'll see. Because it's going to tell us. We're going to find out. Anyway, I am the gate. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Very interesting. Let's see what it says in the Greek. you got to know the Greek's a little bit different, right? Here's the, NI, or the King James. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. shall go in and out and find pasture. You know it's going to be different because the NIV and the King James are a bit different. Ego, I am. Ego, Emmy. I am the Thyra. It was so important that he said it how many times? Twice. Is this third time? 
Oh, well, I think he says it directly twice. That's pretty strong. We're saving, look, every word has cost you 50 cents or five bucks. I don't know, it's pretty expensive. So you want to cut down words, but he used it twice. I am, ego me, the thyra, the door, the gate, through of me. In the case of a certain order thing, anywhere someone, he comes, he will be safe, rescued, and he will come into, and he will come out of. Eis elusteta and ex elusteta. What's interesting about this is this is similar to the term they threw him out of doors. Remember that? Ex elusteta. He will come out from and a pasture, a nomen. He will find a thing sought. I am the gate. In case that if anyone comes into through me, he will be safe, rescued, and he will come into and he will come out from and he will find a pasture sought. Okay, okay, this permanence idea. You can't be safe when you're going to the pasture if who's not with you? Yeah, and hopefully, I hope they have dogs too. Dogs are always good. I like dogs. If you're a sheep, go and pet the dogs. No, I guess you don't want to get near the dogs. But the thing is that you're protected, right? Because the shepherd is with you. You see this permanence as opposed to the robbers and thieves? Um, let's see. The pasture side. And I've got, I've just, these are some, some of the words. We haven't seen some of these. Um, Sozo, I think we've seen sozo before, but safe rescue, this is the word that's usually used for uh, saving in the Sotera. Sotera, sozo, this is salvation, usually translates salvation. It means saving, rescue, and safety. Um, all right, I'm going to blow your world. It's cool. There is no word in Greek for salvation. Why? Yeah. You know, it's always funny to me when you see, like, for example, this is the Greek, this is the Strong's and Vines. Uh, I usually don't quote Woodhouse because Woodhouse is great, but Woodhouse is backwards from what you're used to. You look up the Greek word and find the English equivalent. In this, you look up the Greek word and then, uh, you know, you, you look at the English word and you find the Greek equivalent for is explaining to you what the word specifically means. But you notice, salvation and Savior. Now, you might have a Savior in Greek, but not with a big S. And you definitely wouldn't have salvation. However, the idea of safety and rescue, that's where these words come from. So this is, after 2,000 years, we decided that we're going to put this. Uh, there's some amazing stuff in some of the dictionaries. Um, and the problem is that we shouldn't let, I don't think we should let our, our convincing and understanding get in the way of our theology or vice versa. You know what I'm saying? We as humans create these ginormous things that many times we, we try to find a conclusion and get to the end you go, ah, right? When it's really simple. It's really simple. Jesus is saying he is, right? He is the gate. Therefore, what do you want to do? It's kind of like this chosen thing. I like this chosen thing. Tammy said we're going to watch the chosen. I said it's cool. The chosen thing. They were cho there. And did you see the statement where uh, Simon Peter says, usually the student chooses the rabbi. But Jesus chose them. And I've told you over and over again, in that time, the student literally chose the rabbi, right, and went to the rabbi. Now, the rabbi would, by neglect, the rabbi would, would tell them that he didn't want them, right? That's the way you knew. Because they wouldn't feed you, give you a place to stay, and they'd ignore you. And you eventually figured it out, right, and wandered off because you were hungry. You better do something else for a living. but. In Jesus' time, who chose? Usually, in the Greek worldview, the Greek would choose their, they would, the, the, the rabbi, the leader, Socrates, would choose his students. 
And many times you would pay for it too. Remember, they had the three types. One of them was actually paid. So, you know, it's more like we think of, of kind of a student, you know, kind of thing where, uh, you know, you're a disciple and you choose to go with Christ. No, it's the opposite. You know, the, the leader is choosing you. Right? Am I saying this backwards? Anyway, it's opposite from what we usually think. In any case, in 1010, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that I may have life, that they may have life and have it to the full. Okay, now, this is really interesting. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. The thief who steals by stealth, nor not, is come here going, if may or lace, in order that he might steal by stealth, and he and Thysa. Thysa does not mean to kill. It means to offer a sacrifice. And he might destroy fully. I, Ego, I came and went in order that life they might hold and all around excess, exotion. Okay. This does not say that the thief came to steal and kill exactly. You know, our, our translators are really helping us, aren't they? The thief who steals by stealth in secret is not coming, if not in order that he might steal by stealth. He and he might offer a sacrifice. And he might fully destroy. In other words, this is saying the thief who steals by stealth is not coming in order to steal by stealth. Why is he coming? To sacrifice the sheep. This is why I made the point. You know, as he's standing on the wall and lifting the sheep over, who's he stealing? He's stealing the lambs. He may be taking the sheep and killing them to what? Take the parts for sacrifice or sacrificing. In other words, who's doing this? Now, the Pharisees are happy because the Sadducees. Remember, the Sadducees are the ones who are supposed to sacrifice. So this is a direct thing against the Sadducees. <clears throat> the Pharisees aren't off the hook, right? The Pharisees said, does that mean we're still blind? What are they blind to? What are they obviously blind to? No, what's happening in the sheepfold? What's happening in the sheepfold right now? The kleptus, the kleptus are going in not to steal, but to sacrifice. In other words, they're, they are doing sacrifices. They are sacrificing who? The people. You know, and this is an image. Boy, talk about a strong image here. And not only that, you know, usually like I told you, you're sacrificing usually lambs. Right? Taking a whole sheep over the side of the, of the sheepfold is going to be really hard. I, you know, it's like Sean the sheep. You're throwing a sheep up. Yeah, I can see this. Can you picture this? Okay. But, you know, that's the thing. They are, in, and the point here, it says, he might offer a sacrifice, Thysa, and he would destroy fully. Now, the impression we get, there's two impressions from this. Number one, when are you supposed to totally eat the lamb, the sheep? Passover. Passover. This is supposed to draw your attention to the Passover because that's when the, the sacrifice is destroyed fully. It's also pointing, obviously, to lambs. You know, okay, yes, the, Jesus intends to include the entire flock, all the sheep. But the impression, the words he's using are to draw your attention as the hearer to the lambs and to the idea of Passover. Why? What's the deal with Passover and gates? 
Gates, Passover, what happened? What do you do? You put the blood on the doorposts of the lamb, right? Except who's in, who's the gate now? You see, this is a foreshadowing. You know, the uh, look, all the hearers know the end of the story. It's like Paul Harvey. Now the rest of the story, right? The end of the story, they all know that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. So they know Christ has died. They know the whole purpose. They know the reason. What they wanted to know is, tell us more. John, tell us more about Jesus, right? Tell us, and John is telling them, whether it's good or bad. I mean, there may be, remember I told you, we know from Luke that many of the Sadducees and priests came to know Christ, and therefore they were, you know, in that diaspora. There are a lot of priests who, who accepted Christ, the Sadducees. Sadducees are getting pounded. We know there's lots of Pharisees who also accepted Christ. Pharisees are getting pounded. And even who was a Pharisee? Our buddy? Paul. Saul. His real name is Saul. Why was he called he he Paul? Was, he said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. But why did they call him Paul? There's only one reason you call him Paul. People say it's because he changed his name. He did not change his name. Why did he call himself Paul? Because Paul is Greek. Saul is Hebrew. He's Jewish. So when he was with the Jewish crowd, he was Saul. When he was with the Greek crowd, he was Paul. Now, if you notice, I'm going to point it out again. John points it out from the very beginning. Most of the disciples had what kind of names? Greek names. Hmm. That's interesting in itself. Anyway, the thief who steals by stealth in secret is not coming if not in order that he might steal by stealth and he might offer a sacrifice and he might fully destroy. I came in order that they might hold life and they might hold an all-around excess. And this is pointing back to Passover because what would happen when you had the blood of the lamb on your gate? The angel bypassed them. So therefore they would have life and all around excess, right? This is this is really deep stuff. I mean it, it's it's not deep. It's in the it's obvious I think to the people of the time. It's less obvious to you. Well in a roundabout way he's explaining what the Passover really meant at this point. He's starting to say I'm the blood on the on the mantle post that's the sacrifice that keeps you safe. It's the same thing as you've been practicing all these years through the Passover, basically. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna I wanna point out something. You're right. I think you're right on the money, but because this is not in the in the storyline, right? And this isn't a story, the in the in the historical event line, right? This is happening here. So the hearers, what is their expression? They know what's going to happen to Christ, right? So there's an expectation, but yet at the same time, this is like a mystery, right? The mystery is, you know, they're thinking this, that Jesus is the sacrifice. Remember, what was almost in the very beginning? The first thing he said, the first thing John said, this is the Lamb of God who is the Doron, the sacrifice, the gift, right? So from the very beginning, that's like the foreshadowing. And so there's a foreshadowing, but I think there's also a tension here, an intentional tension. Um, you could call it an artistic tension. I don't care. It, it's, it's intentional. The, the point of that is to excite you as a reader or hearer, right? You're like, oh, I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. But you're like, but Jesus is the gate, right? And so right now everything's really copacetic, but yet there is, I don't want to say the expectation of tragedy. God would say that this is the expectation of salvation, right? To us, it's tragedy because, you know, we go Christ. But yet, 
its expectation of salvation for humanity. So I, I think there's so much in this. Um, I've got explanations for the words. I don't think I need to explain them to you more than I did. There's an irony here. And that's what I was saying before. The sheep are sacrificed first to sac the Sadducees and the Pharisees because they're sacrificing the people. That's the implication that's given. That's kind of a, I think it's less important than the implication of the Passover itself. Here you go. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You wonder when he was going to say it. There's where he says it. And, you know, the, the hearers are like, you know, this is a point of uh, pity and fear. Aristotle said that the greatest tragedy is pity and fear. So you feel pity for what's going to happen. You feel fear because of the expectation, this expectation. This beautiful Greek writing, it is historical, but it's beautiful writing in itself. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life to the sheep. I am, ego imi, ego imi, the one who feeds the flock, the shepherd. The kaleos, the beautiful shepherd, the one who feeds the flock. The kaleos, the well or good, the beautiful. The psyken, the mind thoughts of him, he places sets in behalf of the probatum. Here's the translation. I am the beautiful, well or good one who feeds the sheep, the flock. The beautiful, the well or good one who feeds the flock, his mind, he lays in behalf of the sheep. If the Greek intended this to be life, what would they use? Sarks. Sarks, the body. Or... You know, in the Hebrew, it would be nefesh. Now, we know that psyche is really close to nefesh. In the Greek world, we remember, we got sarx, suki, and penuma. Sarx is the flesh, the, the physical body. Suke is the unconscious breath. It's close to nefesh. It's just... Your natural. And the Greeks believed that when you when you were you were alive because you were thinking. If you stop thinking, you're dead. So don't do transcendental meditation, it will kill you. That's what they believed. And they believed that free will was penuma. That's the conscious breath. So if I consciously take a breath, that is penuma. I am enacting free will. So to them, psychon is probably closer to Nefesh. But notice the words that are used here. I am the beautiful one who feeds his flock. The beautiful one who feeds the flock, his mind, his thoughts, his unconscious breath, he lays in behalf of the sheep. This is really important because what is Jesus doing this whole time? He is teaching them, right? This, in a way, when he says he lays down his psyche, is sukin. He is putting his thoughts, his mind, as well as his breath. He's putting, but you notice our translators. What do the translators do? Life. Well, we got to get more of this because this is really important. I got the, you know, this is the vines and strongs, but this is really important. And here's here's from. I just wanted to note this. This is what it says in Strong's and Vines. Sukho, breath, implication, spirit. Abs and we know so spirit, that's penuma, right? Kind of ish. Abstract and concrete, the animal seeing it, principle only. Thus distinguished from the penuma, which is the rational and more soul, and the other hand, zoe, which is merely vitality. Even a plant, the terms come, you know, respectfully, nefesh, ruach, and che, ish. Remember, it's a dam in nefesh. This is kind of wrongish. Ruach is not held by humans except when God throws it at him, according to the Old Testament. 
in Hebrew thought. But humans have Adam, body, and the fesh. Animals have the fesh. They don't have Adam. Adam is in the image of God. Anyway, Sarks of Yipanu, the body, flesh, and conscious breath, thoughts, conscious breath, free will, and soul. They're confused all the time by our translators. I don't know why they want to confuse us, because this is one of the most important things. The real difference is between Tuki and Panuma. Strong Sir Parap explains it very well. Suki is the animal seen at principle, only the unconscious breath thought in the minds of the Greeks, while Panuma is the rational and immortal soul. But you notice in Greek thought, the animal seen at principle does not exist in animals. Animals can't think in Greek thought. Only humans think. So I think it's it's really interesting because this is part of our problem that we have in our school system today. What do the teachers teach about the minds of animals? They can think things. Yeah, they're just like people, right? Well, man, people are just like animals, aren't you? People are animals. Yeah. And some people are animals. Well, <laughs> people, you know, they try to teach my children that animals have rights. I eat animals. They have no rights. You know, I think it's the most silliest thing in the world. I've been to countries where they eat dogs and cats and other things. And I don't care if you eat dogs or cats. I wouldn't eat bats. It's probably bad enough. I think you've created your own virus. But the big deal is that animals are animals. And what did God say that we should do? Remember when we studied the Torah? God gave us dominion over all animals. Why? Because they don't think. They're created not to think. Uh, we could go into huge detail about it biologically, but if you, if you are familiar at all with biological texts, you know that animals, you know, part of the problem, part of the reason they want humans to become like animals is why? More controllable, of course. Yeah, because then if you're like animals, you're just you animals. Think. Your whole, everything you do is based not on your suke and panuma, free will, it's based on what? Yeah, well, you're, 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 you're right. You're, well, we would, we would call that uh, uh, based on just chemical reactions in your brain. Why do you think? Why do you imagine? It's just chemical reactions. It has nothing to do with, with any higher thing, right? Hmm. Nobody agrees with that in the ancient world, but, you know, whatever. It's, it's a popular view of science today. Anyway, I want to show you a parallel uh, to the literal in 651. The 651. I won't go into this. I'll go down to the translation of 651. I am the living loaf, the Zoe loaf, that from out of the sky, the dwelling beds of God, but not of God, having come down, in case anyone shall have eaten from out of it, of the loaf, he will live into the age. But my flesh is the loaf, which I will give in behalf of the life of thee that which was created. I want you to note this. This is really important. Okay. Jesus told you that he was going to give his sarks. Sarks. And that his sarks is the loaf, right? His sarks is what is going to create this salvation. In this, in this section, what did he tell you he was laying down, even now? His suke. Now, it's not important to us. To us, it's just life, right? It's life. No, it's not just life. It's body, it's thoughts, and it's free will. Jesus, in the first part, tells us, and by the way, this is what he told to Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? The big deal is he is the loaf. He is the sarks. He's giving the sarks his physical form and life to us. And that's what this says directly. The next question from the Greeks is, what about his suke, his mind, his thoughts? Guess what he just answered? He has told you. He gets two. What's that? Yeah. You get those two. You get those two. 
What do you think the next one he's going to talk about? Anuma. To us, because we've, we've, I, I think, okay, I'm sorry. It's a perversion of translation because they want to make it easy for us. So it's, it's arcs, tuke, penuma. It's life, it's spirit, it's life, it's spirit, whatever. It isn't just life and spirit. These are really important terms. It's like agape versus phileo. It's like eros versus uh, pathos. You know, these are really important different terms for love in Greek. And if you say one, you know, it is really, uh, it can be a bad thing depending on who you say it to and what you mean, right? In our world, I love you. I love you, man, right? Playing baseball, basketball. I love you, man. Hit, cool, right? You know, hey, I love you, babe. I love peach too. Oh, 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 it's different, you know, right? And now you get, you know, you got to spend like two weeks explaining what you mean. I'm just saying, life, the words are really important. And our translations have done us no favor in the way they put these. Because, okay, yes, sure. They dumbed it down, makes it easy, makes it easy for to understand these things to a degree. But it also steals. It steals the depth and importance of these concepts, especially within the times and culture. And especially since John is supposed to be a deeper understanding. Right now, I think it's still a great idea. They say, you know, to new Christians to new people who want to know about Christ, give them a book of John. They read it and, and they're so steep with euphemism in English that it's cool for them. Right. They love it. And it's really easy for them to understand because, uh, you know, it's not very concrete. It, it, it appears euphemistic in English. The only reason it appears euphemistic is because of the way it's translated. But that's another question. Anyway, I think it's this is beautiful. Um, so on, in John, I mean, I'm sure you haven't looked that far, but John 19:30, when Jesus dies, and it says, "When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit." Did that be Penuma then? I need to look that up. I have not. I'm I'm in set 18 now. Right. So, I'm at 18. I'll be at yeah, 19 soon. When you said, you know, they're talking about sharks now, CK. You know, getting there, getting to get to Penuma, but anyway, I was just wondering if that was the, the sort of the fulfillment of the trio there. If he talks about Penuma soon, we, I promise you, that when we get there, I will point that out to you a thousand times uh, ten, because I think the most important thing, uh, what we will see when we get there, as a matter of fact. Um, the sour wine, and I got to say this, okay. this you, you know what the sour wine is, right? We learned this. Paul can attest to this. I never knew this. The sour wine is what you, they used on the sponges to clean their after latrine. Oh, we shared a sponge. We learned this in Ephesus. And the reason the sponge is on a stick is because <laughs> that's what they did is they kept the sponge in sour wine on a stick. For the for the use and it was a communal use yeah. so Gross. that's yeah. what they use to clean themselves yes there is an astringent it kills bacteria so there's a, yeah. logical, a logical reason there's a logical reason but that is what they gave to jesus on the cross yes ma'am because it's just a uh, also the sense of love uh, you know, it's sort of natural um, i'm not saying there's not more into the picture but the reason the Romans gave it to them and it was in a pot by there is because they were using it to wipe themselves after. Uh, it wasn't a nice thing. Let's yeah. just put it down. It's like toilet paper. Anyway, and that, <laughs> and they offered it to him, and that's probably why he refused it, you know. Um, I'm just saying, because it was unclean. But, you know, the depths of depravity, again, our translators and our culture, I suspect that most people, I didn't know this until I, you know, but I think a lot of the people who knew Latin, studied Latin, and might be knew Greek, might have known this just because uh, they didn't write about it. Maybe they didn't know about it. Maybe this is just something we've not discovered, but we know, right? Just 
I'm adding to my knowledge every day too. So just very interesting stuff. Um, here we get into <clears throat> here we get into it. So he said he's going to lay down his thoughts before he said he was going to lay down his sarks, his body, his and his body is the flesh, which is really uh, I think an important idea. Remember, flesh. Thoughts, and the next one we're going to talk about is Panuma. We'll get there. It doesn't come, it comes a little bit in this section, but not directly yet. The hired hand is not the shepherd of his own sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. All right. There is a lot more in this than meets the eye. But he that is an hireling and not a shepherd, who owns whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catch them and scattereth the sheep. The mislus, uh, mislutos, the hireling, and Okernot, the being, the one who feeds the flock, of whom which no or not is the sheep, for dang self gazes on the lycon, a wolf. Uh, a common coming or going, and it sends a, away from the sheep. And it flees, and the Lycos wolf, it seizes by force them, and it scatters. Now, I want to notice something. All the, all the Sadducees and Pharisees are doing what? He's not talking about us anymore. Now he's talking about Lycos, wolf. Uh, wolf stands for whom in the ancient world? Roman, yeah. The wolf, the wolf standard, the wolf's, wolf lycos. What's that? Romulus and Remus. Romulus and Remus. So this is, this is a code. This is some code in here, but you're supposed to get it. All the readers in here is get it, right? You seen Ram Ramus Remus, right? And all the legions, the legions are two, they have bulls and they have wolves. They also have lions, mm -hmm. but the animals uh, are are the estimates of them. And I don't know the bull one of the bull ones is in if you read Centurion, you see that they use the bull standard. Anyway, the bull was one of the main ones. Um but and the hireling not being the one who feeds the sheep, the shepherd of which it is not his own sheep, gazes on the wolf coming, and it sends away from the sheep and flees, and the wolf seizes them by force and scatters them. This is both foreshadowing, okay? And this is also what's happening. Remember I told you this is a late date gospel, and so the people know this has happened. What did the Romans do to Jerusalem? They destroyed it. They destroyed the temple, 70 AD. They sieged it. Okay, it was it was the fault of the it was the Essenes and Zealots, basically. You know, you could blame the Pharisees and Sadducees. They caused part of this. It was an uprising of the people, and the Romans came in and basically sieged the city, starved them out, pulled the walls down, actually made them pull the walls down, killed lots of people, and there was a huge diaspora. And Okay, this is talking about that. You know, it's almost direct. Now, the important thing, though, is the hireling. The hireling. Who do you think the hireling is? There's two, two of these. There's multiples of these. But who's the hireling? The religious leaders? Um, they could be, and I'll I'll give you I'll give you that. But I think there's an even better hireling. Um, you got multiples in here. Number one, who was owning the land, and the Maccabees kind of kicked them out. That was the Greeks, right? The, yeah, the Seleucids, the Greeks. You know, after uh, after old Alexander. Well, the Maccabees and Herod was a what? An Edomite, but he claimed to be a Jewish king, right? But he was an Edomite. He had, he had no place in Judaism, right? So who's paying Herod's bills? Romans. Mm -hmm. 
Well, not just the Romans, but the people are paying. But he's claiming to be a king. But he, is he a king? No, he's, he is, you know. And remember the Maccabees, right? The Maccabees were, the, they, they were supposed to be Sadducees, priests. But were they? they? They might have been Levites, but they weren't Aaronites, right? So they can't be priests. There's a lot of people that can be the, the hireling, okay? But there's even more to this hireling thing. And I think I'm going to have to wait till. Next week, get into the details. But what I'll do is I'll give you a foretaste. Remember I told you about one of the big deals about the hirelings? That what happened after, what happened after Jesus' birth and resurrection? or birth, what, what happened after Jesus because of the shepherds in Bethlehem? Remember what I told you? The shepherds are no longer allowed to be witnesses, but who can be a witness? A hireling can be a witness, a hireling shepherd, right? Uh, uh, you notice Jesus doesn't even call them shepherds. He just calls them the hireling, right? Where the shepherd is the one who feeds the flock. Well, this is, this, we don't know if it's happened yet. I suspect it's happened. I suspect that the council has already the Pharisees, and that's why this is being said to whose Pharisees? Jesus' Pharisees, because the Pharisees make the law based on the Mishnah, the oral Torah, right, and the Talmud. And so already, who, who guards the Torah or the Talmud? The Talmud is guarded by the Pharisees. So the Pharisees, I think, have already written this into the Talmud. Not written it literally, because they hadn't written it down yet. They are doing what? They're, they're doing it via their conferences. Their special off-sites that they do, right? Conference off-site, right? They're doing their off-sites. And so I've got it right here. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to talk about the Sanhedrin 26B about the... Um, about the shepherds and about the hirelings. But I think at this time already, it has been set in stone in the Talmud that a hireling cannot, a hireling can give testimony where a shepherd cannot give testimony. And why did that come about? This will talk about it. It will not explain the why. We know the why. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, what did the shepherds do? They went you know, to yeah, and God about everything. Mm -hmm. And who do they go to? The I yeah, well, yeah I, I matter of fact, how did Herod know this stuff was happening? I, I think it wasn't just the wise men coming through. It was the you know this huge thing was happening, right? And the shepherds were going to who? The rabbis, the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, and to the priests, and to everybody in there saying, what did we see? Angels! I mean, it's perfect for Christmas, right? They said, we saw angels, and the angels said to us. And what did the Pharisees say? <laughs> and what did the Sadducees say? <laughs> and what did Herod say? Well, I gotta find me some little babies, right? Yeah. So anyway, We'll continue with this because I want you to see it's really interesting from Sanhedrin, from the Talmud, what it says about the hireling and the shepherds, because I think it applies directly to this, this thing that Jesus suddenly brings up about hirelings. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after this this week in your name. We pray. Amen. Can it really say the hireling <coughs> or is it the word hire, hirelings? Let's see. It says. The, yeah, ho mistos, a hireling, the hireling. So, not plural. It's like it's a name, a derogatory name. 